so we can get Reporting that Reporting in progress. Oh, there we go. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> All right, so we are so excited as the Big Valley Beekeepers Guild to welcome Randy Oliver. Um, Randy oversees beekeeping or sees beekeeping through the eyes of a biologist. He, um, he builds small commercial beekeeping enterprise um, in the foothills in Northern California, and his, which his sons now manage. And it's around 1500 colonies for migratory pollination to produce queens, nukes, honey, um, and now this frees up Randy to actually engage full time in a, in a beekeeper funded research project. You can always donate to his research projects by going directly to his website, which is scientificbeekeeping.com. You'll find the donate button right there. So I urge you to do that. Um, Randy digests the scientific research and is in touch with beekeepers and researchers from all over the world in order to not only broaden his own depth of knowledge, but to figure out best management practices for beekeepers everywhere, which he then happily shares through his various articles in bee magazines, his speaking engagements such as this one, and on his website. So again, scientificbeekeeping.com. So with that, I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen and we're gonna welcome Randy and allow him to share his. Okie doke. Welcome. Well, thanks, Sherry. Okay. So, um. You asked me to, uh, uh, to do uh, one presentation of my research and there's some questions on, on Varroa on monitoring. So I thought I'd start right here with, um, this is another uh, slideshow I have on Varroa management, uh, concepts in Varroa management. So I'm just gonna show you a few slides out of that. And one of the concepts is that your number of mite reductions, your, your treatments of some sort or another per year is dependent upon the number of months that a colony is rearing brood. And you can use my uh, Varroa model to figure that out. There's a uh, tab on that. If you just Google Randy's Varroa oh. model, um, this comes up as an Excel spreadsheet. It works best in Excel. It works some in, in some other spreadsheets. And then you can uh, enter your mite reductions on any 15 day period right here, and then calculate out um, what kind of treatments you're gonna have to do. Typically, <clears throat> um, if, if you have an area with a winter brood break, now most of us in California don't have much of that, you can get by with two 90% epic treatments. The guys up in Canada, they can get by with like a 90% and a 50% throughout the year. They don't have much to deal with my control. In our area, where notice how the uh, colony population changed. This is for a, a cold winter climate when there's no brood rearing uh, during the winter. This is for a climate like uh, California. This would be more like uh, closer to the Bay Area <clears throat> um, where you have the, uh, the, the nectar flow and pollen flow and a fall from um, eucalyptus. Um, it'll take at least three high efficacy treatments. So I got three 90% treatments to keep this mite infestation rate down to a reasonable level. This would be your mite wash right here. And that's only if there's not a whole lot of mite immigration. If you don't have a bunch of treatment free beekeepers around you, flooding the landscape with uh, varroa mites. And then uh, for an almond pollinator, where um, you go to almonds, you're, you're very big in, uh, in February, you come back, you shake, shake bees or you split, uh, take nukes out of your hives. It's gonna take you uh, typically three really uh, strong mite treatments, possibly less strong treatment sometime uh, during the year. So four treatments uh, will generally be required to keep your mite population down to a reasonable uh, level. A couple of uh, concepts that are very important to keep in mind <clears throat> is that you want to get your mites under control early in the spring. That's really the, the key thing for success. So the, um, the absolute increase in the mite population, uh, which means the, the number, the absolute number of mites, not percent or anything, but the, the number of mites in a hive uh, increases um, over time as exponential for every month. Uh, this is what you get. So after th uh, three months, you're about nine times the starting population. After five months, you're going to be about 20, 27 times the starting population. Um, so when, when you have quite a few months of brood ring, the, the mite population can really expand, you know, over 100 times uh, during the course of a season. But here's the thing to really keep in mind. This is not the absolute increase. This is your daily rate of increase of the mite population over the, over the course of a season. And notice that mites reproduce most rapidly right around swarming season. And that's why it's really critical 
to get in there early and get those numbers of mites down because this is where the mites get ahead of everybody during swarming season, very, very early. And people think, oh, I have a, a low mite count right now, no big deal, I can wait. Well, this is when you really wanna hit them early before, so they don't get those numbers started that will then will uh, exponentially build uh, later on. Anytime there's a lot of, of, of brood rearing, a great deal of brood rearing, a very high proportion of brood to bees in the hive, the, the higher proportion of brood to bees, the more rapidly mites can reproduce. It cuts down on their dispersal phase. <clears throat> and anytime that they're rearing a bunch of drone brood, so pre-swarming, um, you're going to have the greatest amount of mite reproduction. If you can nip the infestation rate in the bud, a good strong treatment early on uh, in the season, it really keeps that mite level down for the rest of the season, much easier to control it uh, right here. And I love this. This is a quote from uh, Russell Highcomb up in, in Orland. <laughs> and he says, I'm not treating because I have high levels of mites. I'm treating because I don't want high levels of mites. And Russell can, talks to me a lot. And, and this, this is how you get success in a commercial operation. You just keep your mite levels low all season long. So the, the trick is to find out when, how, which treatments to use when and how to use them efficaciously. Uh, now, the next thing here is to see the rate of increase um, over the months. Now, it's all, all these curves are the same curve. They're just stretched out over different um, uh, uh, durations. And the duration uh, that it stretches out is simply by the number of mites you start with. But the logarithmic uh, increase is always the, the same. It's not like they suddenly take off. All these curves will eventually look the same. They just get a head start if you start out with a higher mite population. So this colony started out with 150 mites. This started out with 10 mites. Well, after seven months of brood rearing, this is still not even a problem if you only start out with 10 mites. But if you started out with 150 mites, you're up into a problem. You're way past the point where the colony is getting ready to, to crash. So the, the point is, is you want to get that start in the season with a very low mite population. Here's an example again, using three relatively low efficacy treatments, only 80% efficacy. Usually, you, most of the treatments that I use are around that 95% efficacy. So even 80% efficacy applied three times starting early can keep that mite population relatively low for the uh, season. The mistake many beekeepers make is they, they wait until they start to get a very high infestation rate. They'll do a high efficacy treatment. They'll bring the mite count way down, but it's too late. The virus epidemic that is the viruses that actually killed the mite has already taken off and that colony will not, uh, will not survive. Whereas um, if you did an earlier treatment right here, exactly all variables look same here, except for we put in an earlier treatment also, that mite count stayed low all season long. Then the last, last point I wanna make is that we, we do thousands of alcohol washes, our mite wash, we use Dawn detergent now every, every year. Um, we're going to do um, if, uh, about 1,500 uh, this month. Um, I already did uh, over 100 alcohol, uh, mite washes today out in the field. <laughs> Not much fun out in the hot weather. But um, so we have a, I have a really good idea of, of what the effect of mite levels are in a hive. And what I see is colonies, when those mite levels are still not excessively high, like when you're talking like 10 or 15 mites in a, in a mite wash, those colonies look fine, they look healthy, but they're not as productive as the ones that have mite counts down around zero to, to, to two mites. So if you want to have pro productive colonies, keep those mite counts really low. Okay, any questions just on, that was an aside on, uh, on Varroa, uh, um, on, on, mo on monitoring for, for Varroa. I'm gonna go return to monitoring a bit on the research uh, presentation. Any questions right now, Sherry? Um, let's see, I'm taking a look. It says, um, when doing a mite wash, um, Paul's noticed that in addition to the larger brown colored mites, there are what look to him to be smaller black mites. Um, are we only counting the larger bound, boundaryless um, mites? They're, if they're black, they're not, they're not mites. Um, so, um, Usually you don't see that on mite washes. You see it on sticky boards all the time. You see like black uh, droppings from uh, wax moth. Um, you'll see uh, the dark brown 
reddish brown veromites in a wash and you'll see some light colored um, calamites, newly emerged mites and sometimes just some shells of mites. <laughs> but you won't see mites of different size. Mites are always the same size. So get a magnifying glass or something and, and take a better look at those. Great, thank you, thank you. <laughs> That was wonderful because I think right now, especially new beekeepers, that's what they're looking, you know, we need to make sure that they have healthy bees going into the fall, even mm -hmm. though in the valley, it doesn't get super cold. We want to set them up for success. And, and now, now is the time. It's even a little bit late, but yeah, right. 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 Yeah, we were already busy early this spring. And now what we're doing is we're, we're our mite levels are very low across the operation. Um, but we're hopping on any hives now where they're starting to climb. When we start getting anything that's got a mite count of two or more, we're getting on it right now. Got it, thank you. Any more questions there? Oh, um, any questions? That's okay, they're not already in there. Okay, so here's what okay. I, I wanted oh, to cover in my- okay. uh, All right, uh, go for it. My research uh, uh, for, from last year, some of the projects, all right, right now I've got, I've got three different field trials going right now and then a couple other uh, research projects uh, in the work also. So I usually have a number of things going. So we're gonna look at these, uh, test on probiotics, one on pollen subs, uh, testing liquids for mite washing, uh, thermal treatment for Varroa, and then uh, um, Varroa control during the summer, different kinds of treatments. And I'll talk about, I'm following up on one of those now. And then the extended release oxalic acid. <coughs> First thing, hive health uh, products. And this is something I've noticed about beekeepers over the years, is they're just suckers for snake oils. Beekeepers always looking for some kind of magic that somebody can sell them in a bottle that they can pour into their hive and make all their troubles go away. Excuse me. Oh, but by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm recovering from radiation therapy to my mouth, my salivary glands have not recovered yet. So I need to drink water frequently, otherwise my, my lips stick to my teeth. <laughs> um, anyway, we don't use anything in our operation, no, no magical things at all. And the things I always ask when people ask me that about, about whether something works, I said, ask the proprietor, ask the manufacturer. If, if they have any supportive data at all, they will show you if they have field tiles that they've done and they have data, I, they're not going to hide that. They are going to be really proud of publishing that. Most all of them don't have that data. And, and I see all the, the salespeople at all the conventions and they call me or they smile at me and I'll, and I'll raise my eyebrows, the question, and they'll look at me back and they'll shake their head. That means, no, Randy, we don't have the data yet that you've been asking for year after year. So in lieu of data, what I'm seeing now, I got emails from a couple of the manufacturers recently of, of these products. They, they send out emails to beekeepers saying, hey, we'll reward you for positive testimonials about our product. So if you, if you give us a really good write-up of positive testimonial, then we'll send you some, some free product. You know, like they, they're not saying like a trip to Hawaii or anything. I blocked out the name of this one right here. And, and I know these I know all these manufacturers personally, and we correspond all the time. And I said, this is, don't, don't confuse testimonials with field data, okay? So one of these manufacturers um, of the direct fed microbials, the DFMs, so the probiotics for bees, had great sales pitches. And it was so interesting. I can sit and talk to them at their booth for half an hour and get really good scientific answers. And then they'll walk into the next door room and they'll do a presentation to beekeepers. And it's like they change their hat and they change the whole script. Well, suddenly they're, sale, they're salespeople again. So um, good sales pitches. So I tested two, two uh, beekeepers asked me to test these for them. The uh, two of the products on, on, the, uh, on the market, Super DFM from uh, um, Strong Microbials and then Pro DFM uh, from Man Lake. Um, <clears throat> so I had a visiting researcher take the bags of these and dump them into uh, bottles and label them A or B. So I am blinded to treatment. And then a third bottle had just plain powdered sugar. So I am blinded whatsoever. And I still am blinded because uh, there's still analysis going on these. So I don't know which is which, but um, so I tested them once, in, once um, uh, against each other, feeding once a month to the colonies from July through November. 
through the stressful period for bees here in California. And one of the manufacturers wrote a letter to the editor, to the bee journals saying, oh, well, Randy tested our product, but he did it, you know, when the colonies were stressed. And I said, well, yeah, that's, when colonies are healthy, beekeepers don't worry about feeding, <laughs> feeding them anything. They wanna feed them stuff when they're, when they're stressed. I did that intentionally. So I tested them in two yards. One was a sunny yard up here in Grass Valley, and one was a shady yard, uh, slightly different ele elevation. We graded all the highs for strength uh, early in the morning at the beginning of the trial, uh, California cluster grading. And I'm here training my newest technician. This is my grandson, Ryder. This is my son, Eric, right here. And Ryder was out of school at that time because of COVID and was a great uh, uh, beekeeper technician in training now, very meticulous. I enjoyed working with him. <clears throat> and then in order to take waste of the hives, I, uh, I welded together um, a, a hand truck and made a portable wheeled uh, scale that you just shove it underneath the hive, pull down this lever, and there's a $600 digital scale right here that very accurately uh, gives us weight. This is a, a beekeeper friend, Alice, that helped with uh, analysis here. <clears throat> and then we, uh, we started off with uh, singles, uh, put a box of drawing comb on top of them, and uh, fed them monthly, sprinkling, uh, blinded. We just label it A, B, or C for treatment. Uh, and fed all these uh, colonies on a regular basis. <clears throat> okay, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna go right to the results. No statistics at all. I gotta move things around so I can read here. Okay, so we have two different metrics. We measured the colony strengths and measured colony weight weights. The starting strength or the starting weight is in the, is the blue column for each hive and the ending is the red column. So these are the start and end strengths, colony strengths uh, in, uh, uh, in the shady yard for um, treatment A, treatment B, and treatment C. And there's no statistical difference between them. Uh, yeah, you can see with your own eye, you have variation, but there's no obvious benefit in strength. Here's for the sunny yard. And again, uh, the colonies tended to go down in the strength uh, actually in this, in this yard. It was a really lousy year last year but they all went down in strength pretty much equally. So no benefit that we could see, apparent benefit in colony strength. For the start and weights, you can see all the colonies gained uh, weight uh, in the shady yard. <clears throat> they all started at just about the same weight and they all ended at just about the same weight. So again, we couldn't see any benefit there. And in the sunny yard, same thing, all started just about the same weight and all ended just about the same weight. So no apparent benefit there. Okay. So now, and at um, two time points, I took um, samples of bees from the hives, froze them on dry ice, and then paid four to $500 for each shipment, shipping them to the lab for molecular uh, analysis, finding out that even if you pay $500 for overnight, that both FedEx and, um, um, UPS canceled their policy of guaranteeing deli delivery overnight. So, and when they're late, they just say, well, sorry, you know. Anyway, what I was curious about is the establishment in the bees' guts. Now, one of the things about those two tested probiotics, these are the core bacteria that are always found in Apis mellifera guts um, anywhere on, on the planet. There's other bacteria that are opportunistic, but these are the core bacteria. None of these core bacteria are in either of the probiotic formulas. So we don't really expect them to establish in the gut, but we're going to uh, find out. So there's some questions to be answered. So these are, all, these are set off for molecular analysis, whether the uh, strains establish in the gut, that's doubtful. But feeding a probiotic bacteria might improve the gut some way. So we're gonna uh, see if that's happening. And this analysis has just gotten started uh, this week. And the second thing is, does it affect the pathogens? That by feeding the probiotic, do you have less EFB? Do you have less, less nosema? Uh, so we're gonna see about that. And this, the other question beekeepers ask, well, how about after you feed an antibiotic? Does it help to feed a probiotic back to reestablish the gut microbiome? Again, these probiotics don't have the core bacteria. But what we did is I ran a second trial then. I divided everybody into three groups and then um, they either got one of two antibiotics 
uh, three treatments or control powdered sugar dusting to try to wipe the gut bacteria out. So three treatments, four days apart of uh, either Tylosin, uh, tetracycline, or powdered sugar. And we waited a few days, whoops. We waited a few days um, for the, after the last treatment, and then we gave them a treatment of probiotic. And then we took B samples at seven days and 21 days afterwards to see whether of the, other, either of the probiotics uh, helped the bees to reestablish their gut microbiome. And again, that analysis is in progress right now. Any questions on the uh, probiotics? Sorry, hold on. I had to unmute. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, yes, uh, one question. Have you tested or heard of a product called Melifera? Melifera Boost from, from Bradshaw, by chance. Oh, from Dave Bradshaw? No, I, no, I haven't. I haven't heard about that one. Okay. And then we do have a mic related question or treatment. Is that okay? Do you want me yeah, to ask you that now? Um, so he says, um, all of my highs are less than 2% mites. I plan on trading with thiamol product um, at the end of July when I take my honey supers off. Uh -huh. should, I, should I do an ox oxalic acid dribble between now and the end of the month? Um, or is it too late to do the oxalic acid sponge? Um, this, we're actually putting sponges on uh, hives right now. We have a big trial with a whole bunch of them on right now. And I can't recommend that because it's not legal to do that. But if you, if you are have an experimental permit to do that, um, I, I assume you do, otherwise I won't answer you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, at, at that kind of low mite level, um, but at, the, at a 2% is not really a low mite level for now. That would be six mites in a, in a, in a mite wash. Um, that would be our level of concern. Um, but in our past uh, treatments, um, that level would be brought down with a sponge. A dribble would, will take down some mites. So right now you got about 50% of your mites in your brood at this time of the year. It's higher in the springtime, higher percent. But about 50, 50, 50 to 60% this time of year, um, which means about half the mites are out on the bees. So a dribble can kill, um, is gonna kill about 95% of them or 90%. So you can get about a 50% reduction with a dribble. So that would be a possibility also. And so that would, would that be, um, would that, would that be helpful given that he is going to do a thymol? Yes, it would. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And we're actually treating hives right now. We're experimenting doing a combination of thymol and um, uh, oxalic sponge at the same time. Uh, thymol for the, the, the knockdown and then the oxalic sponge uh, for the slow uh, uh, release treatment. So, oh, we'll, yeah, so we're all experimenting right. with that right now. Good. All right, that's all we have so far. Okay, so uh, California beekeepers. Um, I was just talking to a beekeeper from uh, West Virginia, a friend just, uh, just before this presentation. He says, wow, our climate has so changed. We no longer have a dry summer. It's just, we have rain all summer long and it just blooms all summer long, the biggest honey crops we've ever made right now. I said, well, that is not the case in, in California at all. We're very much dependent upon pollen sub to get our bees uh, strong for almond pollination. So we, my sons and I spent a lot of money on, on pollen sub. <clears throat> so in 2013, I did a field trial uh, testing what was on the market. And I had some beekeepers ask me to do another test uh, this last year. So here's the ones I tested. Um, one that we've used a lot, the Man Lake Bulk Soft, which is, does not come in patty form. You cut it up into chunks and squeeze it between the frames, between the boxes. Uh, and I tested Global 15% uh, pollen. So Global makes different patties, but this one is their, their flagship patty with 15% natural pollen. A uh, Daydance uh, uh, flagship product, which is uh, AP23. <clears throat> and then Mega Bee, uh, developed by Dr. Gordon Wardell when he worked at the Tucson lab been around for a long time. Ultra Bay, which is uh, Man Lake's uh, uh, flagship, very similar formulation to the bulk soft, but they changed the yeast uh, this year in it. So it has a different look uh, to it. And then uh, a homebrew, this is um, some beekeepers down in the Sanger area, commercial beekeepers who got a recipe for a, a, a homemade pollen sub from a, uh, a Mexican uh, nutritionist um, out of Mexico. And uh, they were curious how their patty would compare to the other patties. So they helped to fund this research also. I call that one their homebrew. 
And then a new one that was a spirulina uh, algae, the green algae uh, called healthy bee. And this one's unusual because they put a very high amount of thyme oil in this patty also, which seemed to make it repellent to uh, bees. They've since I ran this trial and showed that if it was an issue, they now are selling it without the thyme oil. So, um, so we can't uh, compare this test to what they have now. And then I ran a sugar controls where I made up uh, fondant patties with the same amount of sugar that are in these patties, but with no protein at all. We had 144 hives in this trial, eight different treatments in three different yards. We replicated the trial in three different yards to see if we got the same result in each yard, uh, which we did very consistent results. Um, and it can be confusing with you know, feeding them every week, getting the wrong patty. So everything was numbered and then we color coded the patties and they would carry them out in color coded tubs with colored tape. And we matched that to the color of the tape on the patty. We, we didn't pay attention to the names of them. Well, again, we like to blind ourselves. We lay them out on top of all the hives before you feed any patties, make sure everything's laid out properly. And then we would uh, uh, feed the patties. <clears throat> we uh, chose uh, three yards that we knew the bees would do terrible in from past experience uh, in the summer. And this is how they look pretty dry and miserable middle and we crowded the yards heavily with bees so there'd be a lot of competition for any natural pollen and then fed them continuously uh late summer um uh through fall uh and then yeah um, then starting again early into the next winter and here's the layout of the uh of the timeline uh right here we started um in early august um and uh, two of the yards had a surprise yellow star thistle flow so we stopped feeding at this time right here. But each one of the, the orange squares means feeding a patty and uh, blue meant that we fed a half gallon or more of sugar syrup at the same time. Uh, did a midpoint grading in November when the bees uh, started to slow down in brood rearing and went into winter cluster. Did not feed anything when they were in winter cluster. They went uh, pretty much broodless. And then uh, December 15th, it warmed up, they started flying. So we started feeding again in anticipation of almond bloom. And then, um, when the alders started blowing, we, we had to grade them then uh, before any brood emerged after alder uh, flow started. So 21, 20 days after alder flow started, we did our final uh, grading endpoint grading. Uh, any uneaten sub, we removed and weighed so we could tell how much uh, they consumed. And they did prefer some over, over the others. And we did have much hotter temperature in 2020 than we did in 2019 and lower humidity. So the solid lines are our daily temperatures and the dotted lines are the year before. So during this time of year, the, uh, in September, late September and October, when they're normally building up, they got slammed by high temperatures and they did not build and very low humidities compared to the, um, the year before. Okay, protein content of the subs. Um, they varied uh, up to 22%, uh, uh, down to less than 15, but that did not correlate at all with colony performance. As you'll see, these, uh, the red one and the blue one were the best performers, and one had one of the higher protein contents, one had one of the lower protein contents. <clears throat> then we are curious about, I, I uh, stratified the design of the trial, so we had different uh, starting strengths uh, in each group, all equalized out. And I was curious whether starting strength made a uh, difference. And as you can see here, um, there was no correlation between the starting strength and the ending strength. If anything, it was a negative correlation. Those colonies that started stronger actually wound up weaker. Most of them lost, lost strength uh, to our surprise. And I'm going to be writing about why I think that, that was. Because in previous years, we've been able to grow colonies feeding and pollen sub in those same yards. <clears throat> okay, so here's colony performance by the midpoint grading in November, the uh, average of the uh, cluster size here. And you can see here's the sugar control, pretty small, three and a half frames, average cluster size compared to six and a half frames for this one here. So they, by November, these were, they were already twice as large uh, for these better patties right here. So this validated the experimental uh, design. Then um, I sent samples of frozen bees off for molecular analysis. 
and um, also for weights where they dissected off the heads and the thoraxes and then they weighed them, dried them and weighed them. And you can see the, very, the columns to the left for each one of these pollen subs color coded. Uh, this, the left column would be your, um, your uh, head and thorax mass and the um, right hand column would be your total frames of bees. And notice the very close correlation between frames of bees and head and thorax uh, mass. So <clears throat> what it's showing is that the heavier, the, 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 the feeds, the diets that allowed the workers to get heavier in their body mass also were the diets that produced more bees in the colonies. And then we looked at the gut microbiomes in these, and here's the core uh, bacteria right here. And as you can see, the, the uh, uh, bacterial abundance was different from uh, diet to diet, but the bacterial structure, the community structure was identical for everyone. One of the questions I had is, do you need to have natural pollen in a diet to, as a probiotic for the gut bacteria, the core gut bacteria? This, this patty right here had 15% natural pollen. This one had 20%, I'm sorry, this, this one had 20% right here. So, so obviously having a high amount of natural pollen did not increase the, the uh, total abundance of bacteria in the gut. So something I would have lost a bet on right there. What this shows us is that the, uh, these bacteria do just fine no matter what the bees are eating. So uh, uh, a natural diet is not critical for the honeybee. That's good news for us developing artificial diets. Then a couple other things. I was curious also um, whether oxalic acid, continuous treatment, um, would affect the gut microbiome. And by chance, in every yard, I had a few of our breeder queens that did not get any oxalic acid treatments. All the rest got oxalic acid sponges on them. So they had continuous exposure to oxalic acid. I thought, wow, tell you what, I asked, asked the researcher who was doing the analysis, hey, can you pull out, separate out these, the ones that did not have um, any uh, oxalic acid given to them and see how their gut bacteria looked. And so these are the oxalic acid treatment, 81 colonies. These are the non-treated. There were eight scattered through the yards. And you see the gut microbiome is essentially the same. So the continual release uh, oxalic acid does not appear to negatively affect the gut microbiome. <clears throat> okay, so let me find a grid of them just before going to almonds. What I did is I just took out of each group of 18, there were 18 hives in each group. I, I counted how many frames total we got out of that group of 18. We get paid by the number of frames of bees when we go in. So that was the easiest way to look at it. For the sugar controls out of the 18 hives, we only got 38 frames of bees total. Some had, had died and others were just very, very small. Whereas if you look at the homebrew formulation, we got three and a half times as many bees from feeding this diet as we did from the sugar only controls. Very much showing the benefit of feeding a high quality pollen uh, sub. And again, these are pretty consistent that the homebrew and the global um, were the top throughout the entire trial and the uh, healthy bee with that high uh, time oil did very poorly. The other ones kind of in the middle, kind of a, usually a tie between the bulk soft and the AP23. Now, here is the sad state of our art. Most all of our knowledge on the essential amino acids of these pollen subs is from a paper written in 1953 at the very beginning of amino acid research in animal diets. This was just cutting edge research at that time. Since that point, every other livestock industry will give you a diet with the perfect amino acid ratio and have papers on it for chicks that are one week old, chicks that are six weeks old, chicks that are at, at any time point, same with cattle or anything else. We don't even have a clue with honeybees. This is absolutely pathetic. So I've spent a lot of time, this is an 80 page paper, very well written, meticulous research. I have tremendous respect for this. And this researcher was very cautious about interpreting his findings. And in rereading and picking apart everything, I did reinterpret his findings. So I'm gonna go into that. His recommendations for amino acid ratios came from this series of 10 
graphs, where he made up a mix of essential amino acids to mimic the amino acids in casein, the ratio, <clears throat> fed them at either uh, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4% in the diet, and then looked to see at what percentages the bees would uh, uh, grow and where the, the tip point was where they would stop um, growing. And based upon the inflection point of each one of these, they, he determined they should be in a certain ratio in the, in the diet. And oh, I thought I put that table in here. Anyway, he has a ratio widely used by these manufacturers. And he did it all relative to tryptophan, simply because tryptophan came in, where is it here? Whoops. Where is tryptophan? Here, tryptophan. Its inflection point was at 1, 1%. So we said, oh, well, 1% will make everything relative to tryptophan. So de Groot's formulas as ratio is right here, um, where uh, tryptophan is put at the one, one uh, percent or ratio of one, where valine should be a ratio of four parts valine to one part tryptophan, should be three parts threonine to one part tryptophan. And these are the different diets. And you can see they all look like they are above the minimum requirement for each of the amino acids. And I thought when we did the analysis of all, all of these, had a lab analysis of it, and they look really good when you analyze them relative to tryptophan. But I feel that was a huge mistake that de Groot made because tryptophan is, a, is not even that important amino acid. The most important amino acid is leucine. That's the one that is in the highest ratio in the diet. And notice that all the diets are exceptionally high in leucine because they all have soy flour in them. And soy flour is disproportionately high in leucine. What this is saying is that anything above the black line is wasted as far as protein because it's in excess. And I said, we're looking at this all around. We should make all this relative to leucine. So I did uh, put them all relative to leucine. I just made this graph up for you just a few minutes ago, actually. And um, let's take a look at royal jelly here. So the gray columns, for each of the amino acids are de Groot's recommendations. The green is what's actually found in whatever diet this is. And look how close the royal jelly matches de Groot's ratio across the board. A good mix of nutritious pollens, again, almost exactly matches de Groot's ratio. If you look at all these diets, look at with a huge deficiency in valine, big deficiency in valine, big deficiency in valine in, in every one of them. Um, also deficiencies in isoleucine, Big deficiency here, big deficiency here, in almost every one of them. I go, wow, that's the way we should be looking. They don't look so good when you put them in the ratio relative to leucine. Well, I do a correlation coefficient, and I added up the, um, the, the, our, the average amino acid deficiency relative to, leucine, relative to leucine, and the total frames of Bs at the end of the treatment group plotted against, you notice how these numbers get more and more negative? it exactly matched the performance of the pollen subs with a correlation coefficient of 85%. That means that uh, this predicts with 85% of the variation right off the damn formulas that I can have from a lab analysis of these pollen patties. This just absolutely gives me goosebumps. This is just absolutely stunning that it looks like I could have told them before I even ran the trial how well their, their, <laughs> their pollen subs were going to perform. So. Um, so, okay, so since that point, what I've done is I've uh, developed a quick amino acid uh, ratio calculator. That's where all these, oops, where all these came from that you can very easily put your formulation in there and then uh, figure out exactly what you need to add to it or what to change to come up with the ideal diet for honeybees. So I'm hoping this will be a benefit uh, to the manufacturers and beekeepers uh, across the world uh, with uh, pollen. So this may revolutionize uh, pollen subs for honeybees is my my hope. Do you have a question there, Sherry? Yeah, I do. This is this is so awesome. So okay, so here's a question from Paul. Would you recommend the pollen patties over dry pollen substitute for late summer or fall supplementation? No. Oh. Okay. Does he want to know why? Sure. <laughs> I know. I know that 
dry, they would store the other stuff they consume and don't store probably. You're absolutely right. The dry they'll store, the other stuff they don't store. And I was curious about that same question. And um, because I was noticing issues and I talked to other commercial beekeepers who said, oh man, we crashed all our colonies by doing that. And I sent, I sent off samples to the, to the Tucson lab and then they fed it to caged bees and it was only one small trial. I wouldn't do too much with it, but it caused dysbiosis in the bee gut by feeding them that stored pollen sub that was made into um, the dry fed pollen sub. Other than that, it sounds like a great idea. Other than that, what I see is um, when you feed it in the yard that way, it doesn't evenly distribute to the colonies. Some colonies do well in it, some colonies don't, don't gather much. I've used fluorescent uh, uh, tracers in it and then uh, looked at the, the combs of black light. I've got um, fact, uh, an article coming out in the American Bee Journal this month on my experiments in order to try to answer that question. So at this point, no, um, we stopped doing it. And, um, uh, um, and I can't say definitively, but I can say based upon what I've heard from practical experience by the beekeepers and that experiment, I could not recommend it. There we go, thank you. You bet. Okay, uh, oh, back to Varroa. I think maybe we'll just skip through some of these right here. Th this shows, the red is your, your Varroa infestation rate, like for a mite wash. And this shows how it tracks exactly the, the levels of deforming wing virus and the paralytic viruses in colonies. You, if you keep your, your mite levels way down, um, uh, um, Oh, I didn't tell you that. In the pollen sub trial also, we analyzed the bees for deformed wing virus. And in those breeder queens that um, kept the mites low by themselves, even though all the rest of them had very low mite levels because they were treated, treated with oxalic acid, the breeder queens had much lower levels of deformed wing virus, anywhere from 70 to a million times lower levels than the other colonies in the same yards. So um, keeping the mite level really low makes a huge difference on deforming virus. And I showed you about the bro reduce rose rapidly in the spring. So let's get, let's just, okay, so monitoring bro. So you can use uh, the uh, sugar shaker, sugar uh, roll. Um, and the assumption being, if you read it, it that you uh, roll the bees in the powdered sugar and they heat up their bodies that makes the mites release. Only thing is that's repeated by research by scientists everywhere. Nobody ever bothered to stick a thermometer in there to actually see if that was true. I did, it's not true. They don't get hot at all. They, they don't warm up in any, at all. That was a really simple thing to check on that. So then I did, I tested the sugar shake where I rolled the bees for a minute in powdered sugar, let them sit for one to two minutes and then either shook them gently, the blue columns or shook, shook them very, very vigorously for 60 seconds. Now I'll tell you right now, if you are shaking them for 60 seconds and don't have a stopwatch, that seems like an eternity. I doubt very many beekeepers will ever shake for a full 60 seconds, but I did. Then I looked for percent mite recovery here. I never got above 80% mite recovery with the gentle shake. And I got down to as low as 55%. With the really vigorous shake, I only had only uh, two out of 10 that I get 95% mite recovery. I got as low as 50% micro recovery. Uh, and most of the rest, again, eight out of 10 will be low, 90% are below. So the sugar shake, be aware, it's not gonna show you how many mites are on the bees. More accurate is the uh, mite wash, which we used to use alcohol for. Um, and then when we were short for alcohol um, uh, during the pandemic here, I tested out a number of other possibilities, including uh, alcohol, 50%, uh, 70% and 91% just, just to see. And what I found out is you get much better recovery with 91% alcohol than you do with 50% alcohol. So those, again, the recommendations to dilute your alcohol, no. You get lousy mite recovery if you dilute your alcohol. And I chose these for different reasons, whether they had surfactants or no, no surfactants, whether they were toxic um, to the bees or the mites, whether they had irritating essential oils in them, um, and uh, the results, uh, we did hundreds and hundreds of timed washes on our agitators, so 300 revolutions for 60, over 60 seconds, and then found out which ones worked uh, the best. And the winners were 91% alcohol or Dawn detergent. So we've shifted entirely over to Dawn detergent. 
And now we view the mites because of the foam on the top from the bottom, just drop the cup into a stand and we use a magnifying mirror, a 10 inch magnifying mirror, six inch diameter, and it enlarges the mites and makes it really easy to count the mites. You don't want to see that many mites. I was testing a lot of high mite colonies. You can make a very simple agitator with plans with a piece of tool fabric and uh, two uh, solar cups uh, right here. If Sherry's interested for a project, I could supply your whole club with all the solar cups you need. You could have a meeting and make a ton of uh, mite washers. Um, and we use the, yeah, use the magnifying mirror. Um, mite counts, springtime, you want to see no more than one or two mites in the springtime and no more than six. Uh, during the summer. That would be our treatment uh, action thresholds. Here's our setup uh, here where I actually I converted my CRV to a, with a pull out table, uh, so we, uh, a leveling bubble and a leg that drops down and, pull, and our battery powered agitators. And we just blast through these uh, alcohol washes. Here's the, the agitators I built. And I'm trying to come up with a design I can put out for everybody to for building these uh, agitators. This changes everything if you have very many hives. Again, we're doing up to, um, by myself, up to 100 mite washes a day. If we have a crew out there, we may do a few hundred in, uh, per day. So we, these battery, battery powered agitators make all the difference in the world. Okay. Um, okay, controlling Varroa, thermal treatment. <clears throat> the uh, uh, Varroa is far more thermal sensitive than the honeybees are. They start getting stressed at a much lower temperature than the honeybees do. So by heating up the hive for enough duration at a high enough temperature, you can kill the mites without killing the honeybees. And you can kill the mites in the brood. So I was curious about that. And uh, uh, Mike Emery, one of the beekeepers, uh, had this data set. And we talked a lot. He goes, wow, I got great results. Um, but he says, you, you know, you really should check again yourself, Randy. So I did. And the device name is not important. I blacked that out. <clears throat> um, I was just wanted to get a off the shelf device that went to entrance that I could use that would uh, have be thermostatically controlled. And yes, the bees do beard out of the entrance. You put an insulation board over the top and it's controlled by a, a thermistor uh, midway in the hive to keep that temperature. It keeps up to 107 degrees for two and a half hours. Then I put in two additional thermistors, um, one up at the top to see, uh, to make sure that's up to 106 right, right there. And I put another one, buried it in the upper uh, brood chamber up down the midrib below the brood to show, and yes, it did, oh, 106 degrees, I should say. 106 is the temperature, and yes, it did hold 106 for, for two hours. <clears throat> and afterwards, I waited 24 hours and then dissected out brood to see how many mites were dead. These are dead here and how many mites were alive. If they were running around, they were still alive. And here's some drone brood I uh, dissected, and all these mites were actively running around. So there, was, I was really surprised how well the mites survived the thermal treatment. So surprised, I went back, I did a 48 hour count on some to see, and at 48 hours in the drone brood, 12 alive to four dead. Uh, 24, 40 alive to eight dead, 34 alive to three dead, only, only one, one row of drone brood on the bottom barb, the upper box, that I see more dead mites than live mites. And the worker brood, same thing, 22 alive to two dead, nine alive to one dead. So obviously did not. Now, the claim is also made that these mites, even if they're alive, are sterile. Now, if they're sterile, that means they can't reproduce. So I tracked with mite washers at 24 hours. Yeah, they dropped down. And by day 15, the mite level had dropped down. Now, if they were indeed sterile, that mite reproduction cycle is about, about 17 days, they would have continued to drop down. But as you can see, no, they were not sterile. They immediately are reproducing and going again. So I'm um, a little disappointed on that. So what I did, I reviewed all the literature worldwide and drew this time temperature curve, which shows the, uh, the temperature that is um, tolerable by the bees. Anything below this line is tolerable by the bees for this duration. So th uh, 36 degrees uh, C uh, for five hours is tolerable by the bees. Um, this is a line that's tolerable by the mites. And what you can see is where these lines cross, you find the sweet spot right here. 
any combination of, of time duration and temperature here should kill the mites without killing the bees. So I published this for the benefit of anybody who is developing a thermal device so they can actually get the time temperature uh, correct. The device I used was running about two degrees centigrade lower than what they would have needed to get into the sweet spot for that uh, duration. Okay, then I did a trial for varroa control uh, during the summer. What can, you, what can you use when you have honey supers on the hives? <clears throat> Here's a, what we have off the shelf for uh, approved treatments. The only ones you can use when honey supers are on are formic acid or hop guard right here. The rest are not approved for use when honey supers are on. So there's a new uh, hop guard out, hop guard three, and a formic pro, new formic treatment out. Um, and they both have limitations and they, they both are clear um, uh, with caveats on them. I also checked the, uh, the Formic Pro versus Max. This is uh, 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 not with bees, but in a double deep of drawn comb on, in hot weather, 90, 90 plus degree weather, weighing them each day to see how much Formic release there is. This is your optimal range of how much Formic acid you wanna have released in the colony. And you can see they're identical. I was really surprised that the Formic Pro was identical to the, to the max, and they both gave about three days of that optimal range, and they dropped down a little bit below, below that. I did like the Formic Pro a lot better, much less vapor uh, exposure to the operator. And once all the Formic's gone, the bees, because it's got a solid space, they chew up the paper, they chew up the, uh, the gel, and they carry it out, and you don't have anything to remove from the hive. So that's a huge benefit to the Formic Pro. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip that here. And I also tried some oxalic acid and glycerin on the cellulose sponges, either one sponge or two sponges. And we made up a, a thousand of these sponges to test out. I do have a pesticide research authorization in the state of California. So this is only the experimental results for the benefit of beekeepers who have supported my research. Um, uh, uh, this is a stock a shareholders report, essentially. I'm not suggesting that anybody actually use this in their own hives. 263 hives in the trial, seven different yards, two brood cycles duration. We put the treatments in and then we waited two brood cycles to test the mite levels again. High temperatures, low relative humidity, all run with second year queens because I wanted to see if we'd have much queen loss due to the formic in hot weather with older queens. And we started intentionally with a lot of high mite level colonies because you get much better measurements of efficacy if you start with a high mite level colony. If you start with a mite count of two and take it down to one, you really haven't learned anything. And the treatments were oxalic glycerin, uh, one sponge or two sponges compared to the shop towels, which we used the previous year. Hop guard, one strip for five frames of bees. Uh, Formic Pro, two different ways. One strip repeated at 10 days or two strips applied at once and then control hives. There's the shop towels that we had used previously. And here's a, just a makeup picture showing everybody in one hive. So this would be the Formic Pro. That'd be one's uh, oxalic, uh, silo, uh, oxalic glycerin sponge. And there's a hop guard going in. By the way, we really like these disposable plastic restaurant gloves. They cost a penny a piece, so you're not, I'm a penny pincher, so when I wear expensive nitrile gloves, I want to always reuse them or wash them off. These I don't mind just throwing away, and they go on very fast and off very fast, so we like these restaurant gloves here. Or for the formic, I use these tongs, these kitchen tongs, and you don't have to use any gloves at all. You can handle those strips with the kitchen tongs. Typical test yard, blackberries uh, were in bloom at the time. You got a nice nectar flow and the colonies did put on uh, honey during the treatments and results. So here's the, th the data that I collected. This is for the first 23 hives. We had 263 hives, so a huge data set. But I'll show you the results here. And again, I'm gonna show the starting mite count in blue and the ending mite count in red. Underneath, it's going to be the yard. There were seven different yards. This is yard L, yard 
the yard O. So you can see, see if there's a yard to yard. And then I calculate the median value, which means half or above or half or below here. And I can come up with the median efficacy or median reduction of treatment for each one. Now, if you see a lot of red, that means that my counts went up. If you see a lot of blue, that means my counts went down. And as you can see in the controls, the my counts increased by about half again and went up. So now we're gonna compare for efficacy, everything against the control group. And there's the one formic strip uh, repeated and you see a lot of blue. Other than the few outlier hives where the mite counts went up and I have no idea why that occurred. These all occurred in the same yard right here. This is two strips applied at the same time. Lots of blue again, but two outliers in two different yards. Again, I have no idea why that would be. Formic uh, killed the mites. You can see it just dropping all over the, uh, the strips here. Um, after formic, as I always see as formic, it gives a new life to the brood and the brood patterns always look beautiful after formic. And surprisingly, despite the formic treatment during the honey flow, the stronger formic hives uh, drew foundation and put on honey, which really surprised me. Because the formic is very disruptive to the hives during the hot weather. And the question everybody has is, what about the queens? These were all second year queens. This was in August, and they were all starting to be superseded naturally by their workers. So I expected a lot of them to be superseded. But what I really didn't care about was supersedure. I cared about whether they were still, whether there was a laying queen at 42 days after applying the strips. And the temperature was, was much higher. Here's the recommended temperature, this horizontal line for applying them. And you can see we are way above recommended temperature uh, uh, for the first application of strips or when we put, when we put two strips on, uh, slightly above it for putting a second strip on. <clears throat> the bees did beard up a lot. And unfortunately, we applied them throughout this day, the same day. So in some yards, we put, a, we put two strips in these hives right in the middle of the day in high 90s weather. And if I would not recommend that. I would wait till dusk to put the strips in. You know, have better re results. I'm also not clear whether the formic itself kills the queens or whether the bees kill their queen. Because when I cage queens below formic strips, the queens don't necessarily die. And some of the workers will, but the queens often survive right below us, the strips. And here's our, uh, the results for uh, queenlessness. Now, I counted a colony as queenless if it did not have, it was either dead or, or had no eggs and larvae at 42 days. So for the low my controls, 5% of them were queenless when we checked back after two brood cycles. For the Formic Pro, one strip, only 4% were queenless. Now, many of these, I, I can tell you, superseded their queen, but the young queen was laying uh, uh, then by 42 days. The two strips at once, that was tougher, 11% queenlessness. And in one yard that we applied midday, all five of them went queenless. And then low queenlessness with the hop guard and the oxalix uh, in line with the controls. <coughs> For the hop guard, I'm not gonna show you the results because um, I talked to the manufacturer afterwards and they said we should have repeated the treatments. So I actually have this trial going on right now where we applied the hop guard three and we're repeating it either at every seven days or every uh, 14 days. So I will have data for this in a few weeks. So I can then uh, uh, publish. <clears throat> Oxyalcalystra and shop towels. Um, we start with pretty low mic counts. You don't usually see good efficacy with low mic counts, but um, they, it was okay. So, so the median only took it down to 38% of the starting count. With the one oxalic sponge, we get, again, only 50% reduction. So not, not the greatest. Although look at these, like this one here, this started with six, like 65 mites starting count, ending count was zero. Same thing here, start with 50, end the count with zero. So we get these incredible reductions in some of them, but not in all of them. With the two sponges, 
a lot of blue here. Look at these NMI counts. We got reduction down to 10% of the starting count. So much, much, um, much, much better. And when I calculate the efficacy uh, for all of them, <clears throat> the best efficacies that we get with two different methods of calculating it was definitely for the oxalic acid, the two sponges placed in there. Much better than any of, of the other treatments. All the others were good. So this is very, very promising. <clears throat> the question then, if you put in that much oxalic acid, will it hurt the bees? Well, here's a picture of the brood in a colony that we had put two of the sponges in um, afterwards at 42 days. You can see the brood looks beautiful. So no indication that it was harmful to the colonies. Now, here's where I got really interesting. We had three high elevation yards of the Sierra where there was no other honeybees around. <clears throat> Up there, the colonies put on a crop of honey and there was a big pollen flow all summer long. So they reared a ton of drones. Since there was a pollen flow, brood rearing and drone rearing all during the summer, the mites should have exploded up at this elevation. But there are no other hives around, so no mite drift from other hives. In the first yard, <clears throat> in the colonies start with low mite levels, we put on one sponge, 25 grams. On the high mite ones, we put on two, and we got decent reduction. They took the mite levels counts down very nicely across the board, zeroing out some of them with those two sponges. With the two other yards, look at these. Look at the absence of red. Essentially, it just they eliminated the mites from the colonies. This was at 77 days. It's a long-term treatment, but uh, amazing. We had one more group I didn't collect data for where the, my sons had taken some hives um, and moved them up to Nevada for a pumpkin pollination. Again, isolated, no other bees around, put on uh, oxalic acid sponges. They brought them back <clears throat> after uh, at Halloween when they go up to pick them up so I can get pumpkins. And I said, man, I want to might wash these hives. And we uh, were going through them. I said, Eric, <clears throat> how are our counts looking? He said, dad, I've never seen so many zeros in a row of these big, strong colonies. So these, these were at, at, uh, had been left up from July all the way to November. They came back in November, essentially full of honey and no mice. Very, very impressive. We also uh, ran those other uh, tests with them with smaller amounts of box oxygen. It's a single a quarter uh, sponge, either hung over the top bars uh, during, when they were in nukes or a quarter sponge laid across um, the top bars like this. And again, really good reduction, lots of blue across the board. Um, what we found is uh, a strip lay, put in, um, in June um, held the mite counts low clear until mid-September and then the mites would start to climb a little bit. So very impressed by that. We're gonna, we're gonna have a whole lot more data on this um, in another uh, week and a half from trial this year. <clears throat> so the oxalic, this one's a long-term treatment and it works best where there's very little mite immigration from other hives. We also found out we're using a one-to-one -one ratio by weight. <clears throat> when I've experimented with a one-to-two, one part oxalic to two parts glycerin, the bees get agitated, they beard up on the outside and you get some brood kill. So I like the one-to-one -one ratio uh, the best. It's also much easier to handle. It's not as sloppy as the two-to-one. We also found that this is your mite drop on the sticky boards. The baseline value is this green dotted line. And you'll notice for a full month after you apply these strips, you have an elevated mite drop. It doesn't start to drop down until 30 days later to get lower than the starting mite drop. So it increases mite attrition up to 15 times the mite drop um, uh, uh, when you put them into the hives. Now you'd expect if you're dropping that many more mites during that time that your mite wash counts would also go down. But what we saw is here's the baseline for the mite wash counts. They also went up and they also stayed up for almost 30 days. And then after 30 days, then your mite wash counts start to go down. I don't know why. The only explanatory hypothesis I can think of so far 
is the oxalic acid and glycerin is messing with the mites olfaction and they're having trouble finding, um, uh, entering brood combs. And that's just a, a guess. Uh, I haven't done any follow-up research on that. But it looks like <clears throat> the mites may be mainly dying by slow attrition of being able, unable to reproduce. That's why it takes so many days to get the high efficacy. And I noticed I said 25 grams of oxalic acid and 50. That seemed like a lot. So I weighed these sponges afterwards to see how much oxalic acid was in there. Less than half of the oxalic acid ever made it out onto the bees. So when I say a dose of 25 grams is 50, that much is not getting out onto the bees. So conclusion, the reason that the, one, that the two sponges uh, work better than the one is probably because of surface area. So now we're test, doing tests this right now with uh, strips. So uh, cut this in half, and we're putting either one, two, three, or four of the quarter strips into colonies, and we're collecting data right now on a couple hundred hives. <clears throat> we're also testing a couple other matrices too. Uh, question, why initially they thought it didn't work over in Georgia? Well, it was because they had too much mite drift. Uh, we found out a test in Virginia showed you get very good efficacy in the high humidity of Virginia. And then I took this picture down in Veracruz when I was down there a few years ago. Obviously, tropical uh, forest, rainforest, are high humidity, and they got 88% efficiency down there in a recent published trial. So it works also in high humidity. <clears throat> I'm testing out these various matrices. We just uh, eliminated this one. Uh, no, this one right here, which is uh, acrylic felt. Uh, did not work well. Um, this is a maximizer shop absorbent pad. We're, we're liking this one here. And again, the uh, Swedish sponges. Um, what I'm trying to get, find time to do, because I got so many projects going, is doing these titrations to quantify how much actual oxalic acid is on the bodies of the bees in the hive after you treat them. So I perfected this technique. I just haven't found the time to go ahead and do this. I gotta get out in the hives and just do this. I'm hoping to get this done this summer. It's, it's driving me crazy. So I can adjust this, <clears throat> this uh, the pH of this to a pH of six to this distinctive blue color. I can match it to this chart here. And then if I drop a bee in, if there's any oxalic acid on its body, it'll shift it towards this orange color. So a, uh, a good strong dose of oxalic acid will come up usually right around this color right here an immediate change right here. And then you drip back in a titrant and count the number of drops until you change the color back to the starting color. And by the number of drops, I can tell you how many micrograms of oxalic acid were on that bee's body down to the millionth of a gram. And it takes 15 seconds to do this. So that's why I'm frustrated. <laughs> I haven't found time to do this. And you can sit out right next to the side of the beehive and pluck bees out of the hive with a pair of tweezers and drop them in and do it right there on your lap. It's really easy to do. Um, so one of these days, um, I'm going to uh, get out here and, and do more of these. Anyway, oxalic acid glycerin, uh, of all the acid treatments, formic and oxalic application methods, this is by far our favorite, the, the, the safest to the applicator. You don't have to worry about getting hurt. We make our sponges like this now, these strips in a tub, just pour it in, let them soak it up really fast. Um, we, we, we don't use the point, that's only for the taller sponges. Uh, we like the one-to-one -one formulation. And this is experimental. Um, they have now removed the uh, exemption uh, for tolerance. It means they're not worried about EPA and FDA is not worried about it getting in the honey at all. And all this research is um, uh, funded by beekeepers. But hang on, I missed something here. I want to show you a picture of here. Always carry baking soda solution. 10 heaping tablespoons and a gallon of water. And this is all on my website. This will instantly neutralize either formic or oxalic acid on your hands, on your hive tool, on your smoker, anywhere you get it. If you get it on your hands, it's no worry at all. You're not gonna burn up with the oxalic acid and glycerin. Um, it'll start to tingle or burn a little bit after 15, 20 minutes, maybe. You don't wanna rub it in your eyes. Um, but if you do, but, um, and I wash my hands with, with the baking soda three times a day after I put treatments into these, into these hives. When you come back, you just 
force them in your hands. Your hands will bubble up if you have it in your hands. Your hive tool will bubble up. Your smoke will bubble up, and then it's neutralized instantly. So, the baking soda is way, uh, way cool to use. And what I'm going to do is in my slideshow. Stop my share. And back we are. Hey. Got any burning questions? Well, just um, um, just one here. It says, if I were to bleach the top of my frames using the OA sponge. Yeah, which is perfectly <laughs> how, legal. <laughs> perfectly legal. Um, how wet or dry should the sponges be? We uh, saturate them. Uh, uh, you can very easily uh, calculate it out. And what okay. we do is, is um, we, we just uh, take dry sponges, dip them in the solution, let them absorb it for a minute, pull them out, let them drip dry, and then you weigh one. You see how much okay. it's gained. And then if you're going to make 50 sponges, you take 50 times that amount <laughs> and mix it up and pour that over them. And then it's, just, it's in a plastic tub. It's very, very easy. Or you just put on excess, let them absorb it for a minute, pour off the excess, and you're done. Excellent. And, and so it sounds like um, 50 grams per sponge is probably a, a reasonable amount. Yeah, 50, 50 grams of oxalic acid, 50 grams of, of glycerin um, uh, will make one full sponge. Got it, got it. All right, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm backing up to the rest of our live audience right here to see if they have any questions. Do any of you guys have any questions? No questions, no questions. Oh, here we go. Where do you get your Swedish sponges? That's that's one of the reasons I'm trying other matrices. They are <laughs> that when we buy them 500 at a time, they cost us more than when we buy them five at a time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so you can go on Amazon and there's a brand called If You Care that sells them in five packs. And that's the cheapest way I found to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> what? What did you say, Paul? If you care. Sell them to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. How about anyone else? Yeah. Do you have a life? No. Uh, other than that, in bee research, <laughs> no. You, you want to have my wife validate that for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. oh, here we go. We have one of our youngsters. I'll say youngsters, and she's not a youngster. But <laughs> At what point? should we not wash our tools? Because we did oxycylic acid like a week ago and we didn't wash our tools because we didn't get them on it. But if it bubbles, would it be too late now to wash them with the baking soda wash? No, there you go. no, no that, that acid yeah, is there for a long time. And I don't recommend this to anybody. We just, just touch your fingers to, I know we touch our fingers to our tongue. It tastes like lemonade. You got <laughs> oxalic acid on your hands. It's, it's, oh you no. Know, <laughs> No, in a serving of spinach, you can get a gram of oxalic acid. Anything that you touch, you're going to have a tiny fraction of a gram. It's, and it's not anything that's toxic anyway. You just don't want to get it in your eyes. Got it. Got it? Yep, she's got it. All right. Anything else? Do you have a question? Any other questions? No? Paul, any other questions? No? no? All right. Good. All right. I think we're good. So, oh my gosh. So we want to thank so much, Randy, for you to be with us. Thank you for being with us tonight. You bet. It's a pleasure. And right. um, well, stay cool this weekend, guys. We'll try. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so thank go, ahead you. And, go ahead and don't forget to end your recording. Oh, yes. I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to do that right now. Okay. Well, I'm going to go see my wife Our now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next meeting is going to be August 12th. Um, so make sure that you um, keep that on your calendar and we'll send out the links and all that good stuff um, before the meeting. So, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. All right. Oh. Yes. Um, so uh, Paul just asked if we can post something to the group on the next field day, and we definitely will. Um, in fact, um, at the last field day, I asked if he would do a demonstration on how to, um, to do queens, raise queen cells. So we're going to try and get um, a chance to go up there for that as well. Yeah, we'll be a good deal. All right.
All right, everybody wave. Bye. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, we're going to do the raffle. That's right. Okay. Let's see.